So we are going to begin this morning as we continue in our One Life series. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 9, and then we're going to move from Matthew chapter 9 over to the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at the subject that you see up here on the screen. None are too hopeless for Jesus to save. Do you believe it? Okay, because we're going to see how this works out. Because I, I know that, that there are plenty of people here who, who come and visit and they wonder, well, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know if there's hope for me and, and that. And uh, before we go on, understand this, Jesus loves you. And no matter what your life may seem like, Jesus saves and Jesus forgives and Jesus is the one who gives us hope. But before we go to the passage to see the conversations that Jesus had with people as he is reaching out to them. Uh, we're going to start by understanding where we are going. We are going to visit the land of Israel up by the Sea of Galilee. If you're familiar with this map, you know this is basically the, the boundaries of Israel today. And up here, this area, that's the Sea of Galilee. Down here is Jerusalem. This is the Dead Sea. So we're up here in the Sea of Galilee area. And this is the area where... Uh, Jesus did most of his ministry uh, that you read about in the gospel. So let's get a close-up of the Sea of Galilee. Here it is. If you've been here on Sunday mornings for through the One Life series, you've already seen this particular map. But we're going specifically to this area right here. This is Capernaum. And this was the hometown of Peter along with some of the other apostles. It also was the hometown of Jesus in his final three years of his life before he was crucified in Jerusalem. This is the place where Jesus performed most of the miracles that you read about in the New Testament. This side here of Galilee is the Jewish side. This side over here was the pagan side. Uh, this is Decapolis. This would be the, the land of, uh, of, that belonged to Israel. And so with that, let's go get a close-up of this city right here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. And this is how it looks today. This is the part of Capernaum that's been excavated. Uh, Capernaum was a much bigger city, but this is what you see if you're going to take a tour to Israel right now, because I mentioned this part's been excavated. This building right here is uh, built by the Catholic Church. Underneath it is a house, and it's believed that the house that is underneath this roof here was Peter's house from the time that Jesus was alive. Uh, so, uh, this here would be the synagogue that Jesus would have uh, spoken in, on Saturdays, being the Jewish rabbi, and the other smaller structures you see around there that are that are, are the remains of uh, some of the houses. And in the days of Jesus, uh, Capernaum would have been something like this. It was a, a fishing village, as I mentioned. Peter lived there amongst some of the other apostles, and this is where they launched off to go out into the Sea of Galilee and and catch some fish. So that's the backdrop of the area. And the place we are going is going to be a conversation that first takes place between Jesus and some of the followers of John the Baptist. And then from there, we're going to get launched into Jesus ministering to two people who really need help. There's a man whose daughter dies. And there's a woman who's got a great infirmity. And Matthew chapter 9 sets up the whole place where we are going. In Matthew chapter 9, we begin here reading in verse 14. It says, Then Jesus, or then the disciples of John, excuse me, that would be John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. So the disciples of John the Baptist, they came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. Uh, what's going on here? Well, in the previous verses leading up to this, we find out that Jesus is in his own city, being Capernaum, and, and that the city that I just showed you on the screens. And while he's there, there's all kinds of crowds of people that are gathering around him. And he's in Peter's house. And, and there's a paralyzed man that's brought to him and dropped through the roof to him, and Jesus heals him. We saw that while we've been going through this series from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. And then after this takes place, we find out in chapter 9, in the verses just preceding where we just read, the Bible says as Jesus passed on from there, uh, out of the house where he healed this paralyzed man, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He says to Matthew, follow me. And so Jesus or Matthew just gives the one account of when Jesus followed him. 
And then Matthew goes on for the next couple of verses to explain what happened. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, were livid. And they said, why is Jesus sitting at a table with tax collectors? And he just called Matthew, the tax collector, to be one of his followers. Why is this Jesus sitting at the table with sinners? That was the religious mindset. You don't get near sinners. And the disciples of John the Baptist seem to have even been affected by the thinking of the Pharisees. And they're bothered. The Pharisees have said, why is it that we fast, but those followers of Jesus who are sinners and tax collectors, they don't fast. <gasps> Hence, verse 14. The disciples of John the Baptist, being affected also by this thinking, said to Jesus, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? Your disciples do not fast. Verse 15. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? What he's saying is, I'm the bridegroom. I am the Messiah. While I am here, the people are joyful and celebrating. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. In other words, I'm only here for a short time, and then I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, I'm going to resurrect, I'm going to go to heaven, and people are going to be like devastated. Right now they're celebrating. And then he says this, No one gives two illustrations, puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break. Uh, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Uh, what's Jesus doing here? Jesus uses two illustrations, the patch on the old garment and the wine into old wineskins to show that there is a problem. What Jesus is doing, he's helping the disciples of John the Baptist and any Pharisees who would listen to him to understand there was the old covenant of the law. I did not come to repair the old covenant. There's nothing wrong with the old covenant. But I didn't come to repair the Old Covenant. I came to one-up the Old Covenant. Because there is a problem with the Old Covenant. There is a problem with the law. What the law does, the perfect law of God, it pronounces you guilty. And if all you did was live by the law, you've got no hope. In fact, Galatians describes this exactly what Jesus is teaching here. Whoops, I forgot that part. The first thing we see is something old and something new. Okay, let's move on from there. Okay, <laughs> Galatians teaches us this. This is what happens when I'm up here. My mind goes, it's all over. Uh, some people say my mind is all over all the time. It's just done. But uh, that's another story. So Galatians chapter 3, this perfectly describes what Jesus is teaching here. Therefore, the law was our tutor, or schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we no longer are under the law, under the tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is saying, look, you've got the old law. There's nothing wrong with the old law. I didn't come to improve the old law. I fulfilled the law. You cannot fulfill the law, but the law was given so that you can see you are guilty and you need grace. And the person who tries to live by the law and get into heaven based on their perfection will be found guilty by the law. She's saying you can't do that. The Old Covenant tells us that we are not perfect. We need grace. 
So the Pharisees, or John's disciples say, we fast. We keep the law, right? We fast, and the Pharisees fast. Your disciples do not fast. What's up with that? Help us to understand. The disciples of John the Baptist, they fasted out of repentance. They wanted to do what was right. But they still didn't understand that Jesus was the one that the Baptist of John pointed to. So they're still, they got this bondage to the law. They've been baptized, they've repented, but they're still trying to stay in that. They haven't surrendered to grace yet. And the Pharisees, they fast because in their mind, they're the ones that are going to be good enough to get into heaven. They're going to keep all of the law, and when you think it's tough, they're going to give you more laws to keep. And good luck with that. This is what Jesus is teaching. Pretty straightforward. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn, verse 15, Jesus says, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is gone, and then my followers are going to fast. But right now you've got the Messiah. Right now is not the time for fasting. So he's helping to illustrate it. So with that, before we move on from here, uh, understand a couple of things. One of them, A, is that there are times it is good to fast. When are there times it is good to fast? When you need to be right with God. When you need to get your head screwed on straight with the Lord. When you're under a lot of pressure. And you I don't have an answer for this. I need help with that. You ever felt that way? I, I know with me what happens when I'm start to feel stress over a situation and something isn't going the way that you know, it's just falling apart or whatever it is or it's just a bad situation or I need I know there's extra prayer that's needed for something or for somebody what I do is right here between here and here I get pain I don't know I don't know if you guys get that too but I start to actually feel it on the inside and I can tell this is a time when I just need to get, get away with the Lord and say, Lord, I've got no answer for this. I'm confused over this. I'm going to tell you something else. People say, you know, if you're a Christian and you worry, it's sin. Listen, sometimes I get worried. And sometimes I get anxious, but the Bible tells me, do not be anxious about anything. So I notice at those moments when I got this anxiety, I can feel it on the inside. Man, I need to get, Lord, I, I need you. And I come to Him, I open up the Word, I put on some music maybe, and I, and I get right with the Lord. Say, okay, God, get inside my head and, and help me to, to get, be right here, right? Now, there's sometimes it's good to fast. What is fasting? It's when you deprive yourself of the physical joys of food, for example. You say, I'm, I, I'm not going to have this right now. Instead, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have this spiritual food because this is what I need. Make sense? For some of us, it's really hard to deprive ourselves of the physical joys of food. Others of you, it's easy. But there are times it's good to fast. B, there are times it is better to celebrate. When you have the bridegroom with you, that's why my disciples are fasting. When is it better to celebrate? When you are saved. Woohoo! I'm going to heaven. When your new baby is born, when your new grandchild is born, when you get married, when your kids get married, what you, you go, oh, this is a joyous thing. There's times when it's better to fast, and there's times when it is better to, to celebrate. And then Jesus gives two illustrations to help them understand. I didn't come to repair the law. I came to offer you something that is better than the law. Because if all you try to do is live by the perfect law, you're guilty. So the two illustrations, you, you don't take a, a, a new patch and put it on some old clothes because as the new patch shrinks, it'll, it'll thrash the old clothes. And how many of you are like me and you're a product of like the 1960s growing up as a kid? That's all? 
Are you for this? I'm not going to pick on you. How many seriously? Okay. All right. So we're alive in the 60s. How's, how about that? I mean, I can see your faces. Come on. Most of you look as old as me, if not. You know, I'm just saying. Well, I'm not that old. Oh, no. I'm just... <laughs> so you remember this, right? So I remember going going out to play or whatever it is. And back in the 60s, um, you, you, you didn't go outside with holy jeans. I mean, now you got it. You don't go outside unless you have holy jeans, right? But back then, you, you, you can't go outside with holy jeans. And, and my mom, she would take my jeans that have holes in them, and she'd put a patch on them. Remember those patches? Didn't you just feel like a dork when you had those patches on? I mean, I... I, I, I <laughs> seriously, they're kind of dorky. If you love those patches, praise the Lord. That was you. Um, but my mom knew that she couldn't put a brand new patch that's going to shrink, right, on old jeans. Because when it would shrink, it would just thrash the jeans. And this is what Jesus is saying. And then he, he says, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins. Or, or the old wineskins will break. You need new wineskins for the new wine. Jesus is saying, I didn't come to repair the old. I didn't come to repair the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. What I came to do, uh, I am the new wine. I've come to show you that I am the one. I am the bridegroom. I am the one that the law was given to drive you to. I'm the one that John the Baptist, all the baptisms that he made of repentance were to take you to the place of grace. I am the one that the grace is all about. The law can't save, but Jesus saves. I, I, I love that. My, uh, uh, here's some, uh, let me show you this. This might help us to understand it in our context. When we cling to what God did in the past, we will miss what God wants to do next, and we will miss what God is doing now. And so Jesus is saying, look, you're missing the new. You're missing the grace. When you're trying to be bound by the law, man, you are, you're missing out. This also works out just in regular a regular time of your regular Christianity even today. Uh, last night, for example, by the way, i got to ask you this. Um, how many of you were like me and you watched the USC-Texas game last night? Listen, this isn't a bad thing. You can raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, it, was, it was a great game. Um, the only disappointment for me was I wanted USC to lose. Oh, now, I mean, this is so funny. Ask how many of you watched the game. About five of you raised your hand. How many want, I've mentioned USC. Oh, oh, Pastor Tom's going to hell. I can tell. <laughs> so, but it was still a great game, even though Texas lost. It was, it was a great game. But uh, it was a really late game. And I don't stay up late on Saturday night. I got to get my head screwed on straight for Sunday morning. So it's late, and I go, okay, I, I'm wound up after that game. So, um, what I decide to do, we have uh, one of those smart TVs from Walmart, and so we got YouTube on there. So I streamed YouTube, and I streamed Maranatha music. How many of you are old enough to remember Maranatha music? You can raise your hand. It's okay. You guys are so afraid this morning. I know a lot of you are old enough, so I don't know if you might not remember, but that's another story. Um, I'm just like, that's, that was an accident. So, I'm getting really angry stares right now, Scan. <laughs> so I, I got this Maranatha music streaming, and I just really enjoy it. it. takes me back 30 years, you know. really enjoyed that worship music, and, and uh, this is the only time I'm going to get it, is there at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday. I'm not going to get it at much of any place else anymore. So I'm in there enjoying it. My daughter comes downstairs. And she, she wants to sit down and just sing with me. I think she wants to help me learn to sing is what it really was. Because I think she heard me. And so she comes out. She sits in the chair near me. And she's singing. But she has to wait till the word has started to say. Then she will fill in, right? And then she goes, Daddy, can, can you put on music that I know? Here's the thing. 
is uh, we, we can get in the application part uh, so caught up in the way it was, the way we used to do this. John the Baptist, his disciples, uh, the Pharisees, we can get caught up in. Listen, my old pastor, Pastor Greg, used to say, um, methods change, the message cannot change. Music changes from generation to generation, but the message cannot change. The message from Jesus is, look, the new has come. I have come to give life. The law was given so that you could see that you need a Savior. So that's the context of the great hope that the Lord is going to now give. So with that, we move on from number one, something old, uh, something new, to someone young and someone older. And we're going to meet two young people, or one really young person and her dad, and then a lady that's older than her. So with that, please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Matthew deals with this, the two people. But Matthew's account of what we're going to read over the next couple of minutes together is Paquito. It's very short. Mark's account gives us more detail. I would say even even better detail. And, and in Mark chapter 5, we begin and we read this in verse 21. So again, Jesus is in the area of he's in Capernaum. Um, the context is set up from Matthew, the old covenant of the law that drives us to the grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to Jesus, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus, he went with Jairus, Jairus, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. In other words, they're pushing against him. And Jesus is going. He's been doing these miracles. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if only I can touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the multitude pushing against you? And you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, she came and she fell down before him and she told him the whole truth. She's afraid. I mean, because Pat pictured the scene. It's people are pushing and people are shoving, are shoving. And Jesus is following Jairus to heal his daughter. And all of a sudden, this woman just grabs his garment. Power went out from him. Everybody's touching him, but he knew this was different. This was a touch of faith. And he knew it was different. And she's afraid. He's looking around. Who touched me? Oh, no, I'm in trouble. She would have felt that way because she was always in trouble. We'll see that in a minute. People hated her. Ah, but he speaks to her. No doubt this is the first time she heard this in a long time, for she had been ill 12 years. And he says to her, verse 34, Daughter, wow! Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I I love that. In this, we have a little girl, who we're going to find out in a minute, was 12 years old. She has this uh, sudden tragedy. She's dying. Before Jesus is going to get to her, she's going to die. There's a sudden tragedy. She's 12. And this woman who has a sad life. 12 years, she's got this infirmity. And with the sudden tragedy of this little girl is her dad who's watching his daughter die. Some of you have been there. And I cannot imagine that pain. 
Jesus loves you. And we see His grace and we see His mercy. And and the first thing we notice here is uh, this woman that touched Jesus. Um, There's the crowd pushing against Jesus. Jairus says, follow me. Jesus is following her. All of a sudden, um, this woman grabs His garment. He's stopped by the woman. I imagine Jairus, being this ruler of the synagogue, is thinking, wait a minute, my daughter's about to die, and you're stopping for this woman? My daughter needs your help now. I I say what this is, it's an interruption that became an opportunity. In fact, a lot of our interruptions are opportunities. She suffered at the hands of the physicians. Verse 25 and 26 tells, she spent all the money that she had. In other words, she was bankrupt. And instead of being better, she had only gotten worse. But Jesus saw this woman as someone that He could bless. And He did. The law. Remember the setup of the law? The old wineskins. The old garments. Jesus said, I didn't come to repair. I came to do something far better, far exceeding that. The law in the book of Leviticus about this woman teaches that, that she would have been labeled unclean by the religious authorities so that she could not go to the synagogue. She would have to keep her distance from people. She could not touch or be touched by people. Could you imagine that? You can't come into church because you have this infirmity. The law demanded perfection. Jesus said, I, 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 I've come to do something so far greater. If this woman was married, her husband would not even be living in the same house with her. And the law provided divorce for him. So at the time she meets Jesus, she is bankrupt. She is lonely. No doctor could heal her. Not a person could touch her. Not even her own husband. And if she had kids, she couldn't even hold them because that is what the law demanded. Wow. And Jesus says, listen to me. I want you to know what I've done. I didn't come to repeal the law. I came because the law is harsh. The law is difficult. The law is impossible for man to perfectly keep. The law was given so that you would come to know grace. It was an interruption that became an opportunity. I I believe God gives us a lot of interruptions in life from people when we're going about our day and we've got our plans and we're more bothered with the interruption than realizing God may have just brought this person into my life because they need to hear about Jesus and His hope. Now this woman, she touched Jesus, but she didn't touch Him bodily. What she did is she grabbed the hem of His garment and the the garment that Jesus was wearing, this would be a modern day one, something like this, a shawl or, or a prayer shawl. Here's a prayer shawl here. This is at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And you see the tassels that are hanging down? Numbers speaks of this. And Jewish men were to make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments and put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. So this is something like what this woman would have grabbed the whole of the tassel of Jesus' garment, the hem of His garment, grabbed the whole of it. But it wasn't the tassel that healed It was Jesus. If I can just get close to Him and touch the hem of His garment. She had faith in the One. She didn't go to a Christian conference in 2017 and say, if I buy this handkerchief from this preacher, I'll be healed. If I get this coat that says this preacher blessed, I'll be healed. 
She understood the power was in the Lord Jesus Christ and she had enough faith to realize, if I just get close enough just to touch the hem of His garment, man, that will be what I need. And Jesus says, daughter. I have no doubt that's the first time she heard daughter in a long, long, long time. This woman was a complete outcast. Jesus himself said of himself, this describes this woman, John chapter 6, records the words of Jesus, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no means cast out. They may be cast out of society. They may be cast out of culture. They may be cast out of some churches. Jesus says, I will by no means um, cast them. Put it another way, Jesus is touchable even by those that are untouchable. In the words of one author, when a soul is sick today, they often go to different doctors and spend a great deal of time and money only to suffer many things from many physicians. A sick soul may go to doctor entertainment but find no cure. Uh, They may pay a visit to doctor success but he's no help in the long run. Doctor pleasure, doctor self-help, doctor religion can't bring a real cure. Only Dr. Jesus can. That was what Jesus was making. Listen, the religion of the law is not going to save you. The religion of the law is perfect, but it's given as your schoolmaster, your tutor, so when you see the perfect law, you realize, man, I need help. I need forgiveness. And Jesus brings hope. We move on from this woman that touched Jesus to the girl that was touched by Jesus. We're told here, verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Can you imagine that? So Jesus is interrupted by this woman. Jairus says, come heal my daughter. She's almost dead. Jesus stops for the woman, and now they say, ah, there's no point in even doing it because your daughter's dead. Just don't even bug this guy anymore. You're a dad. Can you imagine that pain? Jesus understood it. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken that his daughter was dead, verse 36, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, the the brother of James. And and then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw tumult, and those who wept, and they wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead. She's only sleeping. Verse 40, they ridiculed him. How often that happens. Tell somebody I believe in Jesus. They ridicule you. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, and he entered where the child was lying. And when, then he took the child by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. And, and he said that something should be given to this little girl in order to eat. So we read here, Jairus, he's the ruler of the synagogue. That's that synagogue that you see there, the white building. He was the ruler, apparently it seems, in that synagogue. As the ruler of the synagogue... Jairus would be the chief official, overseeing all the events and the services held at the synagogue, plus funerals, weddings, any meetings, extra Torah, Bible studies, and the the business affairs. In that culture, it also would have come with some wealth. Uh, But even above all that, for him to come to Jesus, he knew he would face criticism and pressure from his peers and, and the Pharisees and the other rabbis and other synagogue rulers. But praise the Lord, because here's what happened. When tragedy struck home, he turned to Jesus. Jairus loved his daughter more than his position, more than his power, more than his prestige, more than his pride, more than his bank account. I love my daughter. I was so moved by an article I read 
just a couple of weeks ago about Keyshawn Johnson. This is my this is football time, so I'm giving this. Keyshawn Johnson used to play for USC, went on through the NFL, was a very good player. Some of you recognize his name. Um, but his son was playing football for Nebraska. A couple of weeks ago, he pulled his son from the football team. His son was a good player. Why did he pull his son? He was smoking dope, and his grades were slipping. He pulled his son because he loved his son. Dads. I, I, I love that about him. I love my son enough that I don't want to see him go down this path. Here's this man. I love my daughter so much. Like any parent. Prestige, power, position, pride. My bank account is not worth it. Jesus, I know that the other rabbis and the other Pharisees are going to mock me, but I need you because my daughter's dying. If you've ever been to that place, you can relate to what this man would have been thinking. When tragedy struck home, he turned to Jesus. I can't implore you enough. Whatever it is, if you're going through something, turn to Jesus. Let me give you four takeaways before we leave. First takeaway is this. You're never past hope if you allow Jesus to get involved. While he is still speaking, while Jesus is still speaking, the rulers, Jairus, his friends from the synagogue, they come and say, don't even bother Jesus anymore. She's dead. Praise the Lord, he already got Jesus involved. No doubt his his heart would have sank when, when he heard that. Listen, I... Jesus saved. Right. Um, last week, if you were here, I had two people with me that I interviewed. Uh, one of them was Ken, and the other was a young lady named Jeanette. By their own admission, Jeanette was a promiscuous young lady that got saved. And somewhat rejected by church and rejected by others, too. And Ken was homosexual. And he got saved. God saves people. God gives them hope. It's the, re- it's the religion that condemns. And Jesus says, the law is perfect. I didn't come to repeal or replace. I have come to show you what's better. I've come to give life. I've come to give it abundantly. And this grace, this hope is for anybody who allows Jesus to get involved in their life and say, here I am. Take me. And number two, stop being afraid of what might happen. Verse 36, the words of Jesus to Jairus. After Jairus hears, your daughter's dead, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Jesus knew that fear and faith don't go together. Kind of like oil and water, right? They don't mix. Fear and faith don't go together. Before Jairus could really trust Jesus, he had to decide to put away fear. Listen, we are often afraid of what might happen. We don't know. I mean, did Jesus evolve? Be surrendered to Him. Let Him take over your situation. Number three, believe the Word of Jesus. Pastor Tom, these are so simple. You've got to be kidding me. I spent time coming here today to get these simple things. Yeah, you know why? Because pretty much in all of our trials, we forget these things every single day. Some of you might remember the coach, John Wooden. Not football, but basketball. He'd get these recruits, 18, 19 years old, that were awesome players. And his first lesson about basketball was, men, here's how you tie your shoes. 
I remember reading about Bill Walton hearing that. He's teaching me to tie my shoes? What? He became the greatest basketball coach of all time, college basketball, because he stuck to the basics. These three points here, we forget every time we come into a new trial. Almost every time. Don't be afraid, verse 36, only believe, Jesus told him. Jesus didn't say, don't, tr- don't try to believe and, and figure it all out. We try to believe and figure it all out. He didn't say, try to believe and make sense of the delay. Why is it taking Jesus so long to get to my daughter when this woman interrupted him? We try to figure it all out. We try to figure out why God isn't on our timing. He didn't say, try. He simply said, believe. Every single thing Jairus faced at those moments told him that the situation was hopeless, but only the Word of Jesus brought him hope. Last, the fourth takeaway, introduce others to Jesus. I am pretty confident that everybody in here falls into one category or another that we covered here. Uh, One of them would be, um, you know, a person who's like this woman who's an outcast, rejected by society, feels that God has rejected her, feels that the church has rejected her, feels that nobody cares, like this woman who nobody was even allowed to touch. We probably all know somebody that feels that way. Perhaps not that, but you might know somebody who went through what Jairus went through with his little girl. and They've lost a loved one and they aren't sure where to go for help. They're willing to do anything. And you have the answers, Jesus. I, I want to encourage you. We have one real purpose here. It's to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that we tell others about Jesus. Because people need to know about him. And they need to know the truth about him. He will in no way cast out anyone who comes to him. The other category is not that you know somebody that's, that's an outcast of society or you know somebody that's gone through that great pain of, of death, but you are that person. And you're thinking, I've, this is me. I've been cast out. I was the one who... I've struggled with homosexuality. I was a promiscuous woman, and now I'm dealing with all these things that have come into my life. I'm miserable on the inside. Jesus loves you. The law says you're guilty. And you can feel it. But Jesus has come to give life and give it abundantly. Um, if I can help you to understand anything, it's this. Jesus' words himself. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him won't perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn you, but that through Him you would be forgiven.